You're listening to Rocket Night. August. This is Anna Marie. How are you? I'm very good. Good. Very nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you too, even though it's over the phone. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to get to to meet you. I was truly blown away by just like the last five songs that I heard. <laughs> I'm like, I can't believe I haven't discovered you guys sooner. It's so awesome. Oh, very cool. Well, I, that, that yeah. Makes me feel good. Thank <laughs> you for saying that. Awesome. So I just have a couple of questions. I, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time, and I do tend to talk a lot. But um, well, I um, I've got basically an hour. So okay, this we won't uh, we whatever won't, whatever amount you want. Yeah, we thank you. We won't take up all that time. But first of all, like I just want to know how are you doing? How are your bandmates doing um, during this uh, pandemic sandwich that? that's going on yeah <laughs> well um earlier uh well it's been it's been a while now but uh, i guess about six months ago we had a bass player that moved to chicago mm. so we were kind of taking a step back from performing gigs so much and getting back to working on this third album which we've been working on for almost two years now uh so we've just been focusing on that and then uh, in January, two people in the band did get real sick, upper respiratory cough and everything, but that was like a month and a half before it was called coronavirus, so they may have had it yeah. in January. Um, but uh, I think everyone's just doing the same at home sort of thing, and uh, I've been at home with my family and doing a lot of building. I uh, built a fence and a chicken coop and a garden, and that's been keeping myself busy. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, so, like, how, I mean, you talked about this last album. Uh, this is the one that's on on the website, right? The, the... Well, we have different songs on the website. They Different songs may have come from our three works that we have. We have our self-titled album. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is the songs you would hear on Spotify okay. um, or like all channels and then some of the songs on our uh, website uh, are from our second album uh, called Prequella. Okay. And then we have a page on our website that's just dedicated to this EP that we did, Halloween Ultima, and we have all four of those songs up there. Yeah. They're kind of songs that didn't fit into the the storyline, so we kind of made this, like, off-key uh, uh, EP with oh, some extra songs. I see. Um, but this album that we have coming up, we have one song up for it that will be on it. It's called Electric Horseman, and we have a video for it up on our website. And that's a song that was the first single that we put out off of this upcoming album. Um, and it will have... I guess, 11 songs on this one coming up. Wow. Like, all, all these songs are pretty involved. Like, I'm I'm looking at your website. Yeah. And it's so, I mean, my, my biggest question is, like, first of all, I love an origin story. Like, it, it just, your music is incredibly cerebral, and that's just scratching <laughs> at, the, at the surface when I say that. Like, how did you guys all find each other, first of all? Okay, well, um, Chris Dixon is the principal music writer, so the uh, the keys of the song, most of the chord changes, and then the lead guitar are all Chris Dixon. Okay. Um, but he's kind of he's kind of shy, reserved, uh, you know, shy genius kind of guy. Um, and I come from a theater background, so I'm used to being more theatrical and uh, 
getting in character and communicating with people when I'm in character. And uh, so I came in and I've just been uh, an enthusiast of the post-apocalyptic scene since I was a young kid, like, you know, Back to the Future, Terminator, Mm -hmm. different time travel and um, end of the world scenario um, sort of things and also fantasy novels um, like Lord of the Rings and whatnot. So I then had all of these ideas for my own kind of story when, when Dixon gave me, uh, gave me like five songs. This is like five years ago, 2015. Now I guess we're going on our five year anniversary coming up here. And uh, he gave me these first five songs and all of this imagery of everything I've been thinking about uh, just came like swarming into my mind. And uh, I wrote lyrics to like four of the songs in a few days. And he got back with me and said, hey, what did you think of those songs? I said, I've already written lyrics to four of them. I'm your singer. We're starting a band. And I've already got a logo going. And he was like, oh, okay. He was like, I was just seeing if somebody might want to record some other stuff on it. And I said, no, we're going to be a full-fledged band with side performers and a whole circus vibe. And uh, so I just kind of commandeered his, his music and then made him write a bunch more of it. And uh, just been adding to the storyline uh, ever since. So this is kind of like a story um, that you would say has several books in it. Is that is that kind of what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I would say you know, with modern, modern culture, the graphic novel is uh-huh. probably more approachable to the wider audience. Um, I, I would write novels, um, but I have a little four-year-old and a ten-year-old at home, so yeah. like getting some time to go into the study and, and write is near impossible. So I have to wait like five or six years before I would start writing the books, but I do have the ideas for the graphic novel, the comics. Yeah. So I would put out 13 comics, um, and they would showcase the different characters that we've developed um, and kind of tell the story of this and, you know, how, how the end times ended up en- ending, you know, the beginning of the end and the middle of the end, the end of the end. Um, and uh, it, it, it pays homage to all the sci-fi and uh, fantasy stuff that I've read and taken interest in in pretty much my, my whole life. So there's tons of little Easter eggs and stuff in there. Yeah. Um, but that's it. The graphic novel, I've got two um, illustrators that are willing to work for like a percentage of the novel, like ownership in it. Um, but without the capital there, you know, it's, it's hard to move forward on that. But I do have another artist that um, she did the cover art for our last album, Prequella, and some other artwork for our characters. And um, she's working on a, a tarot deck. So it's taking our characters and um, putting them in the art typical form of the, um, the different characters from a tarot deck. Yep. Um, so we're, we're working on that. So we have this whole kind of art side to what we do. And like when we play shows at cocktail bars or that are known for showcasing craft cocktails, we have um, a craft cocktail uh, list that goes along with our characters. So there's the Black Rose. Um, it's like a bitters and whiskey. And there's an Atomic Beach Bash that is uh, kind of more like an island drink. And um, so people can meet the characters and then order their drinks and, then see them perform, um, and then our, our end game is then that they would be in a graphic novel, and then possibly in an anime, and or maybe even down the road, a live action movie or something. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> to the next generation, my kids will uh, be able to, to do that part of it. <laughs> that's really that's really good and conceptual. Like so that that leads me into my next question. You kind of just answered it, like. Um, I counted the 11 performers between perform, you know, performers and musicians. Um, so are they all performing at once when you guys perform in what kind uh, of venue? Yeah, so there's, right. So, um, I think if you counted, did you count the faces on the website? Is that where you came up with that or the list of us? D- the, the list on the website. Uh, okay. Yeah, we're so we're expanded 
beyond that, I just haven't gotten around to some people, characters come and go. Like we have a, a group of characters called the girls in gas masks. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're kind of like a post-apocalyptic girl army. They don't take shit from anybody. And they're kind of like the bodyguards for the rodeo. Um, but they also perform. Um, one does like flag core. Um, one can do fire. Uh, one um, has a baton. Um, and uh, so they kind of have these like pseudo fake, you know, weapons with them. And they're kind of like the, the army of the last electric rodeo, which is this vagabond troop of uh, performers, the last of humanity um, that's trying to continually travel the, the, the wastes uh, in search of, of solace. And uh, so those characters come and go, like some girls, that, they'll invite their other friends and they'll come and dress in post-apocalyptic gear and they'll wear gas masks. And so when we do our jingle, the the girls in gas mask song, they'll come out and do like a little, uh, pseudo burlesque kind of strutting around, um, thing. And then, uh, some of the other characters, they showcase just their own song, like the radioactive gout. She's a, a yogi contortionist. And, uh, we will paint her with glove in the dark paint sometimes. And then we'll use black lights. And so she glows in the dark. Um, and then we have another character that's more of like a modern, dance, modern gothic dance uh, character, The Black Rose, when we play her song, she, she showcases and comes out and dance. If we have a spotlight, we'll put one on her. If we have a smoke machine, we'll do that. Um, just depends on the venue. If we play in the dive bar, we, you know, we'll just play a rock and roll set, and um, we might not have, you know, many performers performing. But if we're playing a, a stage or certainly a theater or something like that, then we build the show out to involve more more characters so i would say there's there's probably about still 20 active musicians and performers and then there's probably been 30 throughout the last five years probably 10 of them that we don't see so much anymore Mm -hmm. so it sounds like uh this is more like a troupe then it's a troupe of performers yes uh, right i call it a performance troupe (laughs) um and uh Sometimes I'll have video screens that are up on the sides of the stage and they're flat showing um, some post-apocalyptic imagery that we've collected um, over the years. Um, yeah, so yeah. Um, the goal would be to sort of like franchise it um, like Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we would provide, you know, to a community theater or a college theater program or something that wanted to do our, our show. Um, we provide them the music without the vocal tracks on there, so then they, you know, would uh, audition the singers for it. And then they could have the music or they could have the score to the music, so if they wanted the students or to bring in a band to perform it live, they could, or if they couldn't afford that or couldn't get that together, we provide the music without the vocals, and then they would sing a much like a lot of those Rocky Horror troops do. Yeah. How long And then is... I would li- license it out. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you, I'm, I, I cut you off. I'm so sorry. You said that. Um, oh no, no. I was just said then. Then I would. I was just finishing the thought that then we could license out the the show, and then the last electric rodeo could be playing in cities all over America <laughs> on any given Saturday night, and, and we could do webcasts where you know they're like interconnected and stuff. So there's a lot of stuff that I ideas that I had created. Um, for a band or a troupe or a project when I was in college in theater, um, the theater program, doing interactive theater and uh, stuff like that. Um, so it just I've kind of brought all of that with me in, into this rodeo idea as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's because um, when I was listening to it, I I was thinking, wow, this this could play out like a rock opera. So basically, what you just described, like Rocky Horror Picture Show, I'm thinking um, Tommy, like all of that yeah. can be um, produced. And and so, my next question would be, are these can we can can we see sections of it, to, or do you prefer it to go from start to finish? Oh, every song um, sort of stands on its own and has its own life mm-hmm. to it. 
Um, and then, you know, in Florida, especially, uh, it's such a tourist econ- economy that, you, you know, a lot of the venues, they don't want too much original music, you know, so yeah. <laughs> we still do our choice covers. So there's times where we're playing certain places, uh, the Hard Rock or the Bank and Blues in Daytona or something like that, uh, or the Band Show, um, or the Fringe Festival or something. We'll throw in more choice covers and those covers will kind of have some element in in their lyrics or something that lends itself to the genre that we're kind of trying to cre- trying to create. Yeah. What are your covers? Uh, one of my favorites that we do is David Bowie, Let's Dance. Mm-hmm. Um, but we do even metal like uh, Black Sabbath, Children of the Grave. We do the specials, Ghost Town, uh, Concrete Blonde, uh, Bloodletting. Um, let's see, we do uh, Surf Rock stuff, Dick Dale, um, The Lonely Ones, a lot of stuff from like when Tarantino yeah. soundtrack uh, kind of genre. Um, yeah, we did uh, the Eurythmics uh, few, last year. Did that a couple times. That was a good one. And uh, did, um, yeah, uh, there's probably another dozen or so I can't think of them right now. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I'm thinking, you know, Quentin Tarantino definitely comes to mind. Like, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, this could be a soundtrack to a short or you know, some one of his pulp. Oh, yeah. I used to, <laughs> when we first started, I put up this hashtag Quentin Tarantino, hashtag Quentin Tarantino call me. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we would have loved to be... Um, also, there's a video game called Fallout that's very popular um, and that has a really neat soundtrack uh, to the game. It's a post-apocalyptic game called Fallout. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, so we wanted to try to maybe get a song in there, or there's a lot more TV shows that are coming out that kind of have that theme. So, um, yeah, I mean, if I could get Quinn Tarantino to hear a song, I'm going to do that. I'd be die a happy man. That'd be <laughs> awesome. Right. I was just going to ask you, like, what are your end all be all goals? And that sounds like that would be one of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's still time. I mean, you said you guys pretty much just got together in 2015. So in all, all intents and purposes, you're still kind of a young group, right? As far as groups go. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I would say, and we haven't come into our fullness either. Like, um, I don't have all the, I have ideas for props and stage, uh, pieces and, um, lighting concepts and lighting ideas. Um, so I had in the works to, to work with uh, Daytona State College here in Daytona, close where I'm at, in Ormond Beach. Mm-hmm. And um, I wanted to work with their whole uh, music program, art program, and do this project out there called Build a Band. Mm-hmm. And uh, essentially they would do it with our band, Last Electric Rodeo, but then after the next semester they could do it with another band and uh, they would create graphic design, score music, create music, um, do photo shoots, like all, all the, the facets that a band really needs to, you know, to call themselves professional. Mm. Um, and then have the students that have sort of, you know, do that um, and uh, create a band or what I was calling a build a band. And uh, so if I could do that and collaborate with them, then um, I could, Without the capital, I could utilize the the college um, to do set design and stuff like that. You know that they have money set aside for for um, certain amount of performances a year, and whatnot. So um, hopefully, I can do that, and then the whole thing would be uh, filmed at that point, and then so then it could be um, a, you know a DVD. Um, we could even do a making of, so it could have a documentary, you know, attachment. Um, so I hope to get into that in, in the next year or so. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm actually part of the, um, Southeast Center for Photographic Arts out of, out of Daytona State College. So it's kind of serendipitous. Oh, really? Yeah. It's, it's kind of cool. Awesome. Yeah, it's awesome that my, we're talking. My, my wife uh, graduated from that program and she's 
professional photographer. That's Her name's Megan Harper. Okay. And uh, she uh, specialized for many years in newborns, but she uh, branched out into yoga photography and band photography. And um, so all the photography that's, uh, um, most of it that's on our page and the graphic design and whatnot is uh, she did. Yeah. And she came out of the, the, that program there. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a good it's a good program. So, well, you know, I think there's always a reason for things, right? And <laughs> like, absolutely, I believe there's a big reason for everything. Yeah, everyone that you meet, that you um, come in contact with or work with, um, yeah, there's some something important there. Yeah. So now we're connected. This this is so cool. So. Um, so tell me, like, what are rehearsals like with so many people and, and such a huge concept? Like, do you guys re rehearse often, and what is that like? Yeah, right. Well, um, it was always kind of a chaotic coupling of schedules. Um, yeah, so it wasn't like, hey, guys, show up. You know, we have <laughs> a, uh, I'd have a Google document, and it would have the, you know, the rehearsals are from 6 to 10, it would be blocked out by, you know, 15-minute increments. Um, so that way, if we had a new performer that was playing the character of the radioactive gal, she could come and, you know, rehearse with the band live, hear the song live. Um, and we could, you know, coach her with her uh, choreography and whatnot. But So that would be scheduled for whatever, 6.45 to 7 o'clock. The band would be working on that song Why she happens to be there to be able to work on it. And then, so... Uh, when I was at the top of my game, I had that real down to clockwork, and it was working pretty good. Um, but then, kind of got a little chaotic there, and then um, I just stopped booking gigs uh, because we weren't getting this album done. Like <laughs> a year had gone by, and I was like, "That's okay. Some albums, you know, an album, you know, let's take our time on this one. Let's not rush it." And we just kept saying that, and time just kept moving on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so about four months ago, I said, hey, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not booking anything else for us so that we can get the album done. And uh, then it just so happened with this COVID-19, all the gigs getting canceled. So like serendipitously for me, um, like I had no, I had no hassle and no disappointment because it wasn't like I spent 20, 30, 40 hours, uh, you know, setting up these gigs. Um, and, you know, tickets and artwork and all that stuff for things that would have ended up getting canceled. I, w I would have been probably super depressed. Yeah. But um, the fact that I hadn't had anything booked so that we could work on the album ended up working in our favor, I guess. Some silver lining there anyway. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a lot of, well, every musician right now is at home and, they're not they're not able to collaborate in person so what are you guys doing i mean being so big how is it that you guys are collaborating and, and being able yeah, to do that we um <clears throat> everything is recorded uh, so since we're working on an album uh, we have the tracks and uh, so we'll send the, the current mix to the bass player and say hey come up with two things he records to it we say hey that sounds good um and then We'll uh, bring them in uh, to the studio space, you know, social distancing. It might only be like three of us, me, the bass player, and the engineer. Um, and then we'll, we'll get their tracks in. Um, and then we just kind of schedule people in with the engineer um, one at a time. Mm -hmm. So that, that hap the recording right now actually also kind of coincides with this, um, you know, social distancing and uh, the stay-at-home order and the limited amount of people that should be hanging out, it, that also is just kind of congruent with our our process right now to get this album done. I'm going to say it again. Everything happens for a reason. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if, I feel like if you're aligned, if you try to stay aligned to the energy of the human experience and what's going on for us, then I, then, uh, you tend to find yourself in good spaces and good places with good people, mm -hmm. um, no matter what's going on in the world. Um, so, and I, I believe that. Yeah. 
That is, I'm writing that down. That's awesome. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> that's so true, though. Um, that's that's awesome. So, I mean, my next question was going to be what's next, but obviously what's next is that you guys are going to be finishing up this album that's been in the works for how long now? Yeah, for two years and a half, yeah. Good. Yeah, more than two years, more than two years. January was two years, so <laughs> we're past two years. Um, but we were having a lot of fun gigging, and uh, we did add a new member, and uh, we were building the stage show. Um, we did have some family issues with some of the people in the band. Um, the Chris's mother had passed away, so we kind of gave them a couple months just to chill out. And um, But then he came back with some really cool music, too, that... And is ending up being on this album, so um, so there were some other reasons why why we didn't. But yeah, we're mainly focusing on this. But because of the COVID nineteen thing, a lot of people are joking about uh, you know, oh, is this the apocalypse? Is this the end times? You know, um, kind of tongue in cheek, and that's what our music is. So I think um, it would be a good time to kind of re introduce some of our, our music, our earlier music. So I will be working on a Girls in Gas Mask music video here in the next month. Um, and that's the song that was off our first album. And uh, kind of put out there like a Girls in Gas Mask challenge. Um, so any girls that are our fans or identify as girls, <laughs> we always say that, mm-hmm. um, that want to put on a... Uh, the gas mask and take a picture, like, we'll, um, you know, post it on our uh, our social media and we'll pick a, a winner, you know, and send them a Girls and Gas Mask t-shirt and maybe the new album or something like that. Um, so I'm going to kind of do a little Girls and Gas Mask campaign just because of the, the virus thing going around. Mm-hmm. That's very fitting. So what's, what, have you guys come up with a name for this new album? Yes, the new album is called Retro Futurum, okay. and uh, that's my 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 uh, fake Latin for uh, retro futurism. Okay, <laughs> and uh, so that retro futurism is sort of the genre uh, that I kind of one of the genres that I want to present with with the rodeo um, because in the storyline, like. Uh, different aspects of human history uh, ended up developing because of um, this alien technology uh, that got spread out through through human time. It's a bit of a story. It's the, the more of the graphic novel side of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, That's... I don't know where I was going with that. No, <laughs> no, I asked you, like... Um what the name of the album was, and you said Retro Oh, Retro Futurum. Futurum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so um, I'm supposing that different parts of human history have been altered in, in the past. So people's view of what the future would be, like, say, from the 50s, mm-hmm. like what, what they thought 2020 was going to be like, mm-hmm. um, that's, that concept of going back and rewriting the past view of the future is retrofuturism. Huh. Okay. So, um, so we, it's, a, it's a little esoteric, but, uh, Yeah, that's, so that's my, cool I, I have anyway. to ask, like, my next question is, like, what is your background? What did you study in school? Right, so I started as a theater major, but I ended up, uh, being a Bachelor of Arts in History. Okay. So I've kind of always been a pseudo-historian, and I've been a local historian in Ormond Beach area. And um, so I've just always kind of mixed the historical with the theatrical. Um, And in this case, it's, you know, futurism. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's cool. I mean, because uh, just listening to you, I'm hearing you blend in so many different things, like um, uh, Tolkien, um, who created his own language, right? Like, and so you, right. retro futurum, you you had said that's fake Latin for futurism, and so yeah, because the, well, 
back then, in the past, they wouldn't have had a word for retro, mm -hmm. and they would not have had a word for future, mm -hmm. necessarily, so, um, so I just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, I would imagine that at your gigs, you have um, all types of fan base, right? Like from Yeah, yep, we have all kinds of types of fan base, um, because of the reverb guitar and, um, we have a you know very large forty to fifty year old. I'd say that's our greatest audience, um, just because our music is strangely like nostalgic for them. Yeah. Um, even though we uh, mix these genres, um, and then uh, we have like the twenty something that definitely are digging on what are doing just because of the kind of dystopian nature of, of uh, what we're singing about. It's, you know, very... They grew up with that, like, the post-apocalyptic post sort of theme. I, I was born in 76, and mm -hmm. it didn't really start coming in fully until, like, maybe 1986, so I was already 10 years old. But anyone that was born from 1986 on, like, that genre and that type of story is... They've seen their whole lives. So, um, but then for some reason, we, everyone's kids love us. <laughs> so if we're playing like a show out, um, like in Ormond Beach, there's a big lawn, the Rockefeller Gardens and a stage on the river there. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll kind of tone down the show a little bit to like, you know, PG 12 or 13. Um, but like seven, eight, nine, 10 year olds, 11, 12, 13 year olds, um, they just, like, well, they'll be dancing, they'll want to meet us afterwards. Sure. Um, they're asking their parents to, like, buy our albums for them, <laughs> and then their parents are, like, messaging me later times, like, I've never seen, my daughter's never been obsessed with the band. Like, there's not even, like, radio popular bands. <laughs> and so that's been the coolest and kind of weirdest mm -hmm. thing that, like, I would have never expected. Yeah. It's well. It's a show. You're building something. It's 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 more than just uh, performing a couple of songs. You're you're really building a concept there, and it sounds very unique. I I don't I don't think I've ever seen this anywhere else. Have you? I'm glad to hear that. It's <laughs> very encouraging to me because I'm definitely going for that. Um, I ran a original music organization for eleven years with a couple other buddies in the Volusia County, Central Florida area. We, it was called Homegrown Roots. Mm -hmm. And uh, we still do online social media stuff, like advertising for people and um, posting people's shows and posting nostalgia stuff. But um, in running that organization, like I was trying to get original music, give it a stage, give people who had original music a place to, to perform because like in Florida, every place was a tourist place. I just wanted cover bands. And cover bands were all that were getting hired. Mm -hmm. So we kind of um, just kind of maneuvered our way into off nights at different venues, um, getting original music out there. So being a leader of that movement, like I always push myself real hard to be as, to be as original as possible and to be riding the wave of what originality can be in in our modern times, because really there's nothing original, but everything has been done. So it's the way that you juxtapose those original things from the past and you juxtapose them together to kind of give you this sense of newness, but then that nostalgia is always there because it's from something that you're already familiar with. So in closing, like what... Um what what would you like for your audience to know? Um, I know it's a short interview, but in closing, well, like, what, I would, how would like you... our audience to know that in the face of, like, you know, our, our opening sequence is Welcome to Last Electric Rodeo. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong, and the rodeo is all that's left to the world that was. Join our hapless band of vagabonds as we make our way into the retro future. Rejoice, end timers, for if you are here, then you're alive. So in that kind of opening sentence, we're saying that no matter what goes wrong, no matter how bad things get, we, have, we still have each other, and we still are a family that is going to survive some way, somehow, and we're so 
still going to find revelry and happiness and joy and love. Um, all those, none of those things can be distinguished no matter how bad things could possibly get. Um, and so we would just ask our fans to, to join us sort of in that, that movement and, uh, to come and have some fun with us and dress up in their own post apocalyptic gear and become, uh, their own character, uh, that we can, um, put into our legacy. We'll write, write your character into our, uh, graphic novels. Um, you know, we'll take pictures of people when they come to our shows in costume and then they'll end up seeing a drawing of themselves in a comic. It might be a year or two later, but we'll, we want to incorporate all of our fans in, into the, the story and the imagery and, um, that, that sort of thing, making it a interactive experience. That's awesome. I appreciate that. You're listening to Rock at Night.